Okay, I think we should. I think we should get started. Um, I want to thank all of you who have come to this presentation on Cuba. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to Cuba? Uh oh, we better be careful then what we say because you know something. Um, and my name is Eric Leinson. I'm the director of an international project called Socially Responsible Enterprise and Local Development in Cuba. Uh, Rafael is the Cuban coordinator of the project. You want to say, say hello? Hello. <laughs> and um, basically, we've been involved. Rafael, of course, is Cuban, but the project has been going for about seven years in which we have been taking a number of international experts, primarily Latin America, from different countries, Brazil, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, Costa Rica, also Canada and Spain, uh, to exchange and dialogue with the Cubans about what is possible with regard to socially responsible enterprise. And it's been an interesting experience. We've organized a number of conferences uh, over these years, many of which were on topics that were really never discussed very publicly um, in Cuba before on these notions. We've also taken delegations of Cubans to a number of different countries for meetings with their peers and to conferences for educational purposes. So that's kind of been the overlay of the project. We're just now beginning to get into actually doing projects on the ground. So far it's been much more exchange and dialogue um, about what's happening in this world of, of new economy. So what I'm going to do is briefly give an overview. Uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Rafael who will fill in for the many things I will miss and give you, you know, a more of a, a direct Cuban uh, perspective. But we plan to leave lots of time for questions and answers because uh, there's so many different issues we could deal with that it's better to find out what your questions are rather than to try to present them all. But as a way of starting out, let me suggest that much of what you read and hear about in the United States about Cuba is not accurate. That's nothing new. It's always been that case, the case. And there is a lot of stuff appearing in the media that really is not speaking to the heart of the issues going on in Cuba. And it's coming from both the right, of course, but also from the left as well. So we'll give you our opinions on some of these things and happy to have a discussion. You may just very well disagree. Um, but essentially, what we're looking at is a Cuba that is undergoing very dramatic change. And the change, which of course has caught the American press, is the fact that there's been the normalization of diplomatic relations which occurred back in December of 2014. But in some ways, that really isn't the biggest story. The Cubans have embarked upon a program of reform, which they call actualization, updating, of their economic and political model that really reaches back into the year starting around 2010 when there was a very active discussion in Cuba about what this new model should look like, or what the updated model should look like. So where, where we're, we're going to start from is 2011 when this program for updating the economic and social model was approved by the six party Congress. And what were the major elements there? Because this is really reshaping Cuban society. Well, one was a recognition that the economic system really wasn't working to the extent that they hoped it would be. And it was interesting because the highest leaders, including Raul Castro, made the point that this was an internal problem as well as the fact that you know, Cuba faces a blockade. In the past, many times, it was the blockade that was given the emphasis for the economic problems in Cuba, but this time it was different. That, you know, there was really a, a recognition of the need to change things in Cuba internally. So what are some of those changes going to be? And then the, question, the fair question is how they've been carried out so far, which we can get into. Number one, really important, was the concept that the state could no longer 
employ all the people that it had previously. You know, at the height of state-run economy, perhaps 93, 94 percent of the population was employed by the state. The idea was going to be that this would change, that about a million and a half workers out of a, a, an economically active population of about five million or so would be basically laid off from the government and that the private sector would take up a very large role in re-employing these people and hopefully generating a more prosperous economy. Okay? Now, the private sector in Cuba includes both the cuenta propista, the sole proprietor business people, that's what you read about in the press all the time here in the U.S. When they talk about the half million, you know, private entrepreneurs in Cuba, they're talking about people that have started their own businesses uh, as sole proprietors. And I'm sure Rafael will get into more detail about this. But then the other thing that's very interesting is they really talked about promoting the idea of non-agricultural cooperatives. And this is quite interesting because for the history of the revolution throughout, the agricultural sector has been largely, in terms of production, in the hands of cooperatives. And there are different types of cooperatives. We can discuss that later if that's of interest to you. But what was different about this measure was for the first time, the state was saying, we're now going to authorize non-agricultural cooperatives. Not the best name to put something in the negative, but that's what they call it, unfortunately. So the idea would be that there would be a process whereby these cooperatives could be approved and then could begin functioning. And this has raised a lot of expectation, especially with people involved in social economy and among Cubans themselves, of what the possibilities of this would be. And in that sector of these new cooperatives, there was a list of categories in which they could occur. And there were two types of, of cooperatives. One would be what they call grassroots, where a group of people came, were spontaneous. People came together and formed a cooperative. The other would be, and this is really important, former state enterprises that would be converted into cooperatives. And that's really important because that fits heavily into this notion that the Cuban state sector was going to divest itself of many industries, occupations, it didn't want to control any longer. You know, huge swaths in the service sector, uh, whether it be restaurants, uh, markets, uh, hairdressing, uh, construction, transportation, you know, to name a few. And this really fits into that mold. So remember I said that there was going to be a transformation into the private sector. The goal, ultimately, is to move from an economy that was 95%, let's say, state-operated, into a 50-50 economy in terms of, of the um, employment of the population. So this is a huge shift, and that's being carried out. But a great part of that has been among these cuenta propistas, sole proprietors. Unfortunately, in the non-agricultural sector, the um, cooperative movement has not really had the opportunity to flourish because the government has retained very tight control over the approval. It's a very complex process to approve no cooperatives. And of the new co cooperatives that have been approved, which by the way is 500, since, like, since 2011, although the process really got going in 2014. Yeah. Uh, so it's 500 have been approved, of which about 330 are actually operating. And of that amount, 80 plus percent were former state enterprises that were converted into cooperatives without necessarily getting much preparation to understand what a cooperative is, which generally has not been a good formula for successful cooperativism, but it, it, it's mixed. Okay, so increase in the size of the private sector, huge dynamic within Cuba. Secondly, there was going to be increased decentralization of economic activity so that the state-run enterprises would have a lot more autonomy in making decisions than before 
where pretty much everything was decided by the ministries in Havana and a central plan. Now Cuba, and this is really important to understand, still believes in central planning and has stated time and time again that this is not a move towards full-blown capitalism. The slogan of this whole period is to create a prosperous and sustainable socialism. And that's important to understand because a lot of Americans, especially business people, don't go to Cuba with a total misconception of what's going on. And that it's not about opening up broadly to capitalism. So you don't have to worry about getting there before McDonald's. It's not going to happen <laughs> for some time. And that's the refrain you hear from everybody, and it's just not happening quite that, that fast. Um, so you have the decentralization. You have the, the privatization. But again, looking at cooperatives as part of that in, in the economy. And the other thing you have is the desire to encourage foreign investment. The Cuban economy is really not in very good shape. And the leadership, economic leadership of the, of the revolution recognizes that they need to get about two and a half billion dollars a year in new foreign investment if they're going to meet their goal of a 6% um, growth rate. In, in Cuba. Right now, the growth rate is right ar currently around 1% to 2%. You um, might want to address that as well. So it's, there's really a problem about lack of capital access to, to projects of all sort. This is a country which is basically, because of the blockade, because it's a, basically a poor country to start with, you know, has been capital starved for 30 years. So there hasn't been replenishment of industries and, and things of that nature. Um, and they need lots of, of new resources, particularly in the field of energy, which is a huge problem um, as we see what's happening in Venezuela and other places and Cuba's ability to access um, petroleum. Now, the other element that is important to keep in mind is where Cuba is extraordinarily strong is in the development of human capital. I think most of you are probably aware of the strong tradition in Cuba of social gains of the revolution, particularly in healthcare, education, arts and culture, sports, that has really made Cuba a much more egalitarian society than many other countries around the world. Um, and they need to look to how to use that human capital as a strength as they try to insert themselves in this global economy. So to just summarize and pass the baton on to Rafael, what the goal of our project has been, working with Cuban counterparts, and we work with many institutions in Cuba, is kind of the following questions. One, how can Cuba develop a sustainable, successful economy while really maintaining and expanding the social and other achievements of the revolution? And two, how can that be done in a way to leapfrog the now outdated 20th century practices using high carbon techniques? How can it leapfrog into a really sustainable period of growth utilizing its human capital and scientific abilities to look at itself as a leader? Um, which Cuba, you know, many of you are too young to remember the role Cuba has played in the world, but Cuba has been a leader for decades, whether you know in many issues of social justice, uh, leadership for the third world, um, solidarity, whether it comes to sending doctors overseas, all those sort of things. Cuba is in a position again, if it's going to use this new sort of framework to provide interesting leadership in the world. And with that, I'll turn it over to my good partner, Rafael. <laughs> good morning. Um, After such an introduction, it's hard to continue. But I think that one of the questions you may have is, why are we doing this project in Cuba? And, um, and I think that at, at some point, this process of transformation has a yin and has a yang. Right? So it basically has the, the positive side of re 
uh, kindling the, the Cuban society and the Cuban economy. Uh, the, the steps that are being taken by the government with the, the people are basically necessary steps, but they bring about uh, certain costs. There are obviously costs, and the first cost is there's going, there is already, <clears throat> it didn't start with the measures, it started with the economic crisis in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, much greater inequality than characterized Cuba through the 1980s. Uh, and the fact that people, the majority of people do not live from their salary, but from other forms of income that supplement their salary. And that has to do with the, deva the, the devaluation of the purchasing power, the real devaluation of the Cuban uh, peso. And this, which began as in, par in part as a result of, of uh, the, we say in Cuba that everybody fell into the hole simultaneously after the crisis of the 1990s, but not, we haven't gotten out of the hole at the same pace and with the same uh, success. So there's still a lot of people in that hole. A lot of people who live off their, their state salary. And they may be quite capable professionals or, or productive people in factories and whatever. But if they live from their state salary, it's very hard to survive. And so the other sources of income, many of them are non-work income, like remittances, like whatever you manage to grab and resell, or you know, the sort of the underground economy, the, the, uh, the, the base uh, form of, of, of corruption, which is not the corruption at the high level that you see in other countries, but it's taking a light bulb because you can't buy a light bulb in the store or you don't have the money to buy the light bulb when it's offered in, in convertible pesos, so you steal the one in your, in your workplace. Then everybody doesn't have light, right? So this kind of loss of solidarity or loss or sense of social commitment which is basically in the Cuban DNA. The Cubans, we have had this sense of community or taking care of our own, um, not only historically, but also as, as a result of the culture of the revolution. And that's being uh, hurt. The, the, that's being um, affected by this process, which is also allowing some people in this sector of the, 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 the private sector which includes farmers, that many of them are better off than most farmers in the world, and relatively to, to the rest of the population, because farmers uh, sell their produce for good prices and they make money. So you go to a, a, a tourist hotel and you see the Canadian tourists and the farmers. It's really crazy. But sometimes you don't see the doctors or you don't see the, the, the scientists, uh, but you see the farmers. So it's, a, it's what we call an inverted pyramid. The, the people with the, with the most skills, with the most training, with the most education, sometimes are at the bottom of the pyramid instead of at the top. And this has also brought, is this also the result, I guess, of the process of strengthening the managerial functions of the, of the public enterprises run by the state, which are commonly called state-owned enterprises. They're not owned by the state, they're owned by the public but they're run by the state. And then they're run by the state like you run any corporation. Hierarchically, the workers don't decide who their, the, their managers are. So you have a structure that separates the workers from the process of, of management of their own work, workplace, but also to the degree that now the focus is on uh, being profitable, then the social function of those state enterprises, which before was very strong. They played a huge role in their communities. They, the, they played a huge role in, in uh, aiding people after, for example, a hurricane or a storm. But this was a socially responsible behavior that came from the top. You were, you know, you were ordered or organized or, 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 uh, or sent to a particular area where a storm came through in order to help. And everybody went and they did it with their heart. It wasn't something that was done forced, but it wasn't something that was indigenous to the, to the enterprise. It wasn't something that was decided by the workers. So we have this situation with the change in the, in the, the public enterprises. We have the rise of the, the private sector, which includes, I should say, this, this concept of uh, 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 so worker-owned uh, sole, sole proprietor actually applies to 80% of those five 
100,000 that are licensed. So the first thing is how many are working that are not licensed, all right? That there are a lot of, of private workers that are doing either in complement to their state salary. So sometimes there's a little double counting in this because you can, I work for the state. I'm a professor at the university, but I, I have a, 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 a license to be a, 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 a translator interpreter. Because that's as far as the license can go. I do a whole lot of things more than translating and interpreting. And I don't pay taxes on the income that I earn there. I only pay taxes for the things that I do. So the state gets, uh, uh, you know, loses out on some of the taxes that I should pay. But I can't declare everything that I do because those are not authorized activities. So you have an activity called computing, no, uh, computing equipment programmer. The term is like in the 1980s. There are people in there, software engineers, people that are, that Cuba has graduated thousands of people in the IT uh, sector. And they are doing the most incredible, you know, uh, design of apps, uh, program design. They're working for German firms, for American firms, all over the place. But they have a little license that says, programmer of computing equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, uh, so this is kind of, this kind of situation of trying to put a lid on an uncontrollable process of growth and development, particularly of young people that don't find their space in this state economy, but they could find, and they do find their place in the Cuban economy, in the socialist economy. It just doesn't have to be in the state. And then the other growth of the cooperative sector has a characteristic as well. There's over almost 5,000 agricultural cooperatives that have always, that have existed since the, early part of the revolution with different types of, of agricultural cooperatives. And their sense of responsibility in their communities, in their, with their families, with other people, are legendary. They're really part of Cuban society. It's what you might call the company town. So you have a cooperative, and everything around there, the community, the people, the children going to school, the, the taking uh, products to market from your cooperative, and the one next door that doesn't have a truck, or the truck is broken, that's part of the, of the culture of solidarity. But the new, and I refuse to say non-agricultural cooperatives, I say uh, uh, the new industry and service cooperatives, that the majority are urban, these cooperatives uh, come up with, as Eric says, about 70%, 77% are induced from the state. So you are, so imagine you work in a restaurant, and you, the state, it's a state restaurant. So you make a lousy salary, you make some tips, and then instead of putting so many gra you know, grams or ounces of whatever chicken, you put a little less, and at the end of the day, you take home some chicken, or you do this, and, that. and that's how you live. You learn to live under these very uh, precarious rules. So somebody comes in and says, okay, everybody, now you're going to be a cooperative. Say, what? Yeah, you're going to be a cooperative, and you can, get me, you can make the decisions, you can share the profit, and you can decide who you're president and vice president. We're going to assign from the beginning, so, you know, so the process, uh, the actual manager, and then the other people, in the, the, you know, the, they are, uh, from the beginning, your directors, but you can change it. And you can, but sometimes people, you know, they don't. They may be because they're good, or may don't because they're the people who have to change them don't. Uh, don't have, don't take that initiative. So, but you have to pay taxes, and you have to buy your your raw materials or your 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 inputs. Uh, a lot of it in the retail market. Some will continue to sell at a reasonable price. So, therefore, you are trading security in in a kind of in a kind of a, a, um, precarious and, 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 and living. And, you know, and a mediocre type of future for a, a, a promise, but also a lot of more risk. So these new cooperatives that have come up, and, and I'm excluding here the ones that have come from the grassroots, there's more than 250 applications for grassroots cooperatives that have not been approved. A lot of them is because they are in, 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 a, in a professional fields that are not yet approved as um, activities open to private sector. So in the, in the end, you have cooperatives that don't have this DNA of, of, of social responsibility. And that made us think that if we were going to contribute 
If we can do something to keep Cuba socialist, we have to act upon the fact that the Cuban society is changing and the Cuban economic units are, are now more uh, uh, encouraged to look for, out for themselves, to make a profit, to be efficient, to, to you know, me first. And that type of process, this is where the socialist solidarity economy or the alternative economy comes in. We saw things outside that were produced, were generated from the crisis of capitalism from the crisis of neoliberalism in Latin America, where the state pulls out, and then the community and the civil society and the cooperatives come in. We have the exact opposite. We have a huge state that's, that's trimming down. So when you trim down, that's the space for the social and solidarity economy. Not too many people in the Cuban leadership believe that, not even in academia. We struggle all the time to make those concepts, Cubanize those concepts, make them applicable to our reality. So I just want to add as one last moment that the Seventh Party Congress was held in April. The Seventh Party Congress generated, first of all, reviewed the guidelines that Eric discussed, how they were applied, how successful uh, they were, and they actually updated for another five years. But they also produced two other documents. One is the conceptualization, you might say the vision, of the Cuban model, economic and social model uh, of socialism. So this is like, what socialism are we constructing? Where are we heading? And a, a, second, model, a second document is the program for, until 2030, which is basically the five-year plan that, that has, was completed <coughs> or partially completed. The other five-year plan that's, uh, that's come out of that now this is a sort of the 20-year plan or the whatever, 14-year plan. Uh, so it's a little longer term plan to implement or to construct that vision which, uh, which was um, presented by the party for discussion. And this is the interesting thing. Again, like the, the guidelines in 2010 and 11, this is being discussed at many levels of society. Of course, at the level of the Communist Party, the Communist Youth, but at, in every university, in every workplace, in the associations, the, the association of, of, uh, of uh, comunicadores sociales, social communicators, which includes advertising, but includes the, the journalists and everything, discussed it in their assembly. The economists have discussed it in their assembly. So it's a place where people are <coughs> giving their views as to this vision for the future. The vision has a, a certain number of, 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 of basic concepts that are not in question that are not being questioned. And one in, is that we are committed to constructing socialism. And we are committed to maintaining a society of social justice and a society that, pri that prioritizes the, the, the good of all. And the economy has to continue to be in, in, as a function of people's needs and not as a function of profit. But you can't do that with a bankrupt economy. And that's basically, we are pretty close right now with the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, right now, which has reduced the oil, uh, but also Venezuela buys a lot of services from Cuba, and the payment of those services is a year late. And the crisis in, in Brazil, which is the second most uh, important market for Cuban professional services, Cuban professional services is the first source of foreign income in the country. It's not sugar, it's not coffee, it's not nickel. It's the, the, the sale of Cuban professional services abroad. And our top markets, besides Venezuela, which a lot of it is a swap for energy, are Brazil, which is tottering, which is shaking, South Africa, Angola, and in the Middle East, the rich countries in the Middle East, Qatar and, and Saudi Arabia. And then a lot of other countries. A lot of them get them for free. A lot of them get uh, their students to come for free or for subsidized right to study medicine in Cuba or other professions. But a lot of those are services that the Cubans provide, and that's income for the country. To be redistributed, to, to go to the health system in general, to maintain the free housing and free, I mean, free education and free health, particularly health, because the money from health goes to health. Um, and other sources such as nickel, the prices have plummeted uh, this year, compared to the low prices of 2015. Sugar prices, which we didn't, we didn't fulfill our plan of production, 
are also very low. And, and so Cuba is in a very difficult coyuntura moment. Yeah. And so uh, in this context that right now we're talking about all these changes in the context of a moment that is very difficult for the country because, among other things, the embargo, the blockade has not been lifted. In March, uh, President Obama said in Havana that the, the use of the, Cuba, of the US dollar was going to be permitted. Well, it's now July, and, the, and, Q, and no banks will accept deposits of US dollars made by Cuba or Cuban institutions. So that still hasn't worked. The only thing in economic terms that has flourished from the US-Cuba detente has been tourism. That has increased significantly. And tourism is now the, the overworked uh, um, the locomotive, the overworked locomotive in the Cuban economy. And uh, everything else, trade, investment, everything else, nothing has happened. That's all bullshit. Nothing has happened. And nothing has happened in part because the Cubans are very cautious. But in part, in many, in great uh, reason, it's because the embargo is still there. Leave it at there. I talk too much. Let me, let me just add one thing. So we're going to open for questions, but there's one other element that's very important to understand. So we're talking about privacy. We're talking about changing the economy. We're talking about foreign investment coming in. We're talking about decentralization. But there's something, and of course, relations with the US um, next door. But then there's one other element that you need to keep in mind in understanding the context. And it's about demographics in two ways. First of all, the revolutionary leadership is dying off. The lead, top leaders of the revolution are in their 80s. They've already you know, said this will be the last party Congress. They're going to pass on leadership to younger people. That's going to be an interesting challenge within the context of everything else we've talked about. And the other problem is that Cuba is an aging society where you have a situation in which the birth rate is very low and it's very desirable for young people from Cuba to emigrate. Why? Not because they're necessarily opposed to the regime, but there's simply no economic opportunity for them to live very well. I mean, again, a lot of you have been in Cuba, but you don't, it's hard to really understand how difficult the conditions are until you get to know Cubans and you see how they live. So for example, Rafael's job you know, for the state is he's a professor at a college. Well, you know, if you were to look at his salary, and I'm sure you don't mind me disclosing mm -hmm. this, he pays more in gasoline to get to his job than he makes at the university. Well, and he's, you know, old enough to have a job. You know, so you're looking at, at younger people who are looking at this idea they'll never get ahead. They would <coughs> love to have more opportunity in Cuba. So you're seeing a large migration of younger people, which of course is exacerbated by the U.S. policy still in place of letting Cuban immigrants enter the United States and get green cards. But nevertheless, these are real tensions in the country that need to be looked at. So with that, why don't we open up to see what questions or comments there may be. Yes. Uh, the first one is called Conceptualización del Modelo Económico y Social de Socialismo Cubano. Algo así de, de, de socialismo. Y el segundo se llama Plan de Desarrollo hasta el 2030. I have them actually in my laptop. If you want to copy the PDF versions, uh, cool. they're in Spanish. I haven't seen a <coughs> translation of the documents. I think one of them is online in, in English. In okay. English? Okay. So, you know, they were just actually published relatively recently in the press. And then they, they made these tabloids in, in like newsprint, which are sold for one peso. One peso is one twenty-fourth of a dollar. And you know, they, they, they produced many thousands of them. But some of us prefer uh, PDF form. Yeah, I, I, I want to come back to the, uh, I think the point you made originally about what, with all these changes, how does it relate to socialism? And so conceptually, if we think of what a socialist uh, society or economy might look like, there are probably two core aspects. One is that you have to deal with the contradictions of capitalism. You have to control 
processes of accumulation, concentration, right. redistribution of income, exploitative labor relations. Right. Okay, that's one side. On that, it sounds to me like a lot still happening. Mm -hmm. okay? But the other side of a socialist, constructing a socialist model is presumably to build just alternatives. Yes. And from what you're describing of these changes, it sounds to me like it's more a case of the state outsourcing hmm. what it did previously, or privatizing in the sense what it did previously. And I'm not really seeing the, the just alternative element. Right. So what is okay, well, I was saving a little bit of that discussion to the, for the panel tonight. Uh, but you raise a very important point. I think that, that you are you're pretty accurate. That the, the, first of all, it's very important to understand that some of the goals of the alternative economy are there in Cuba and they haven't been lost. To begin with, a good share of the natural resources and land and uh, is owned by the public. It's not private. It's privatized. It's a part of agricultural land that's privatized, that's owned by farmers, and there's a whole bunch of it that's leased to farmers. Okay? More and more of land is leased to farmers, but the ownership of the land still uh, lies in the public sector. And this is true about mines and forests and, and, and you know, the coasts and our... Uh, Even factories. And a lot of the industries and all publics or most public services. So that is one of those conditions of socialism that's basic. It's who owns the means of production. Right? And the, other, the second one that's basic, which still exists in a little shape form, is the, is the planning as a substitu substituting the market in the allocation of resources or distribution of resources. So when you have a capitalist country, the, the market allocates the resources. So, for example, why does Cuba produce vaccines for hepatitis B? Well, because there is the market for hepatitis B vaccine is in the third world. They don't pay anything, and so the Greek pharmaceuticals don't have any incentive to produce hepatitis B vaccine. So Cuba does it for its own population. Then it goes out into the third world, and then now it has been successfully marketing that at other rates. So this concept that you produce what the, what the market can pay. Well, in Cuba, the concept of planning is still very active, very important. But the planning is not just, should not be, cannot be just uh, central planning. There is a role for planning at the local level. There is a role for planning within enterprises. And there is a role for the market to give you indications of where the, where the plan should change and modify. And that's the role of the private sector market, which is already in existence and is playing a bigger role. So it's, it's planning with a market rather than planning by, that, the, market. Uh, by the market, exactly. Now, the, when you're talking about the divesting or the outsourcing, this is basically what the state has been trying to do. We are divesting or we're, we're, we're outsourcing a lot of activities that are really not profitable and, and not in part of our strategy. We can't lose our, we can't waste our strength in, in you know, in, in, in cutting people's hair. That should be somebody else doing that or in the restaurants or the cafeterias or the many other, or transportation and so on. When you do that, you're also transferring the risk. So in a way you're saying, if you were not profitable before, now you gotta be profitable. And, and, and it hasn't been a failure, let me tell you, despite the, the, the handicap of, of some of this. It has been quite successful. The majority of these cooperatives, the, the members are, are earning three, four, up to 10 times what they were earning before. But it has affected prices, retail prices, so the consumer has also been affected. And there are many links that are missing in this. Now, what is missing, I think, and I think it's in the intention of the documents, is the concept of a more democratic socialism. And this is what we, I think, are very, and there's a lot of people in Cuba who are saying, okay, this is fine. We are totally in favor of socialism, but we need a more democratic socialism. And that requires the state not only to divest itself of its uh, in inefficient enterprises, but divest itself of some of its power. And that is a huge contradiction right now. Okay, you have a generation in power that really survived 50 years, 55 years of aggression from the United States by maintaining a very strong unity. 
We're talking that in the most worst moment of the special period, as we euphemistically call the economic crisis of the 90s, there was more unity. The Fidel's leadership was stronger than at any other time. And that unity is shaking now because people are, you know, they're looking for, out for themselves, they're looking for other options. And with the new, new, the new relationship with the United States and in general, with the rise of these market forces, what you're seeing is a threat to that unity. So to the degree that you, yeah, you turn over power, say to the municipalities, and this is the intention, and we're seeing it, we're seeing the municipalities playing a bigger role. They're, may, they're, they're planning together with the, the uh, forces, in the, the active uh, players in the community, including the private sector uh, players and, the, and the, co the cooperatives. They're doing much more, but sometimes they don't know how to govern at the local level. Because it's been all said from the top down and they're conservative and they're afraid that if they do this, you know, they may lose whatever little post they have, position they have. So there is a conservatism coming from inexperience and from certain, uh, con uh, you know, threat that this may cost me my job. And this process is going to take a long time. But listen, let me tell you something. In 2004, the government was regulating how many chairs you could have in a private restaurant. And now they're saying, OK, open up the private restaurant and pay your taxes. We're going to make sure you pay your taxes. So I mean, we, are, we have evolved a lot. We have changed a lot. But the whole process of decentralizing power and, and devolving power to the people, a people who I think has been used to and conformed with a very centralized process of, 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 the, of, of growth. So a very paternalistic socialist uh, model and to which you know, a lot of people feel comfortable with, particularly the older generation, a little bit like you're talking about. And so there's a little fear of changing this model. The younger generation is pushing. The spaces are not there. And may, some are, but many are not. So I think that, yes, the concept of going a lot further in terms of developing socialism is Totally, um, you know, and, a, an issue. And just to add to that, imagine, as we said before, Cuba's strongest resource is in professional services, in their educated people. And yet, other than the computer programmer, none of them are allowed to form cooperatives. So it's sort of like you're tying. No, the, co no, the computer programmers are not either. Not one has been approved. But, uh, right, but they're. They have licenses. They have licenses, yeah. okay. But they, yeah, you're right, they're as private proprietors, not as, as cooperatives. So it's sort of like you feel sometimes as though there's one hand tied behind the back as they're trying to move forward. And I think personally, there's a sense that there's a limited time frame for how long it will take to make these changes because the world is, is changing quickly. And unfortunately for Cuba, it's so close to the United States. So even though the United States claims it wants to have different relations, I mean, it, the ideological model is so strong in the United States, and the force of trying to move Cuba into a much more capitalist model is, is always going to be there. And it's attractive to some people. I mean, you, you have people that have not had access to resources for many years, and then you have people coming in from the U.S. and <coughs> other places offering resources. So it's a, it's a tricky situation, which the government is trying to manage. Go ahead. Okay. In terms of this immigration, I mean, how are folks dealing with the fact that there's a general unemployment crisis throughout the world? <coughs> you know. Well, it's a little bit what happens with immigration to Europe and to the U.S. Uh, in general, which is it's better to be poor here than to be poor there, or even to have a little bit of resources over there. So people are coming because in one way or another, the, you know, you have a, a support system, and for Cubans even more. Cubans are very privileged still in terms of immigrants. First of all, they can enter as an illegal immigrant. They can cross the border, and they are immediately granted a work permit. And in a year, you get your green card. And, uh, and it's only for Cubans. So that fuels the immigration. Secondly, there is a, a strong Cuban-American community in Miami and some others that continue to be a source of, of support. Because you get jobs, maybe badly paid by US standards, but you know, they're OK for the Cuban while they are you know, beginning their new life. And, and, I, and, and this is happening as well in Spain. There's a lot of Cubans in Spain. But then there is this the phenomenon of the return. So I have friends that are returned from Spain because they lost their jobs. They <coughs> saved 20,000 euros. 
In 20,000 euros in Spain, how long can you live? A year, maybe? A year, maybe. Maybe. In Cuba, you start a business. <laughs> you come back, you got your family, you have everything, so people are coming back. And then we have to, we have to go beyond the concept of the brain drain, which has always hampered us for years, and start thinking of migration as a process, as a, as a circular process, where the people that went come back sometime later with other skills once they have the opportunities in the, in the country. These opportunities may mean not making the same amount of money that you were making in Europe or in the US, but you have other amenities. But you have to have those opportunities, and they're not there yet. They're there for when you fail here, when you don't have anything. To do. But you know, and then there are other people that are retiring. And so if you make $1,000 in Social Security, if you, you know, if you paid $1,000 in Social Security, in the US you don't go too far with that money. But with Cuba, you can live well. In fact, you can live well, you can retire, and you can help your family with whom you're going to be living. Because that always inserts into a family structure. But, but let's give other people. Just oh, you just okay. finish it up. Just, I'm, it's a question of how long does that cycle, do we think that cycle is going to last, just given the general crisis that we're all facing? And yeah. just to give an example, like where I'm at in Jackson, Mississippi, the unemployment rate, the real unemployment rate is well over 50%. And we are now facing a phenomenon, we have a similar thing, most of the black youth, as soon as they graduate from high school, they're gone. But now, there's really no place for them to run to because there's no jobs yeah. in virtually any place else. Well, in the case of Cuba, there, there are two elements. First of all, in case you don't know this, the Cuba law liberalized its immigration laws uh, several years ago, where, whereas before it was very difficult to leave Cuba uh, from the part of the Cuban government. Now it's pretty simple. And you can be outside of Cuba for two years, and then as long as you come back within, you basically retain your Cuban residency, citizenship, the whole business. So that's important, and that gives a window for people to try things out, whereas before it was a very dramatic you know, final decision. Yeah. The other thing, really, is U.S. policy. The day the U.S. says, hey, we're going to treat you like Guatemalans and like Mexicans, it's going to change the whole phenomenon because it, it's so easy, to, it's so attractive to come here for the reasons Raphael mentioned, that, you know, why not? I mean, it's sort of like, let's just do it. And there, there are a lot of people right now leaving Cuba to come here just so they have it already done before the U.S. changes right, its right. rules. You had a question over there. I think, yeah. Yeah, just given what you just said about how, like, people are, you know, some cooperatives are forming, but, you know, people who have been working for the state and that kind of thing for a really long time, like, maybe don't have some of the, like, knowledge or skills in things like collective decision making the stuff that makes a cooperative work. Is there any role for kind of people who have experience in social movements and like cooperatives and stuff here to like do capacity building or like training or whatever uh, in Cuba? Uh, there are opportunities through projects and exchanges that are not very, you know, easy, but they are there. A lot of, uh, there's more and more academic exchanges between Cuba and U.S. universities. There are some projects that are being carried out in Cuba, but in general, you don't see that many, let's say, foreign people uh, the experience in particular uh, skills in Cuba unless they form part of a project. For example, there's a project by uh, Mundo Kide, which is the, co the, the, uh, the foundation of Mondragon. And so the, this, let me give you an example of how this works, because it's not just, I'm going to go to Cuba, I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to spend some time working and sharing my skills, which would be great. <laughs> I think it would be great if we could do that. The Cuban government is, is, uh, has to re, re, re uh, something. Industrial? Yeah. Re the, the, the sugar sector has all these outmoded sugar mills. And there, there were 180 sugar mills in Cuba producing less than four sugar mills in, my, in Florida in Central Florida. And so th they have to renovate all this. They have to ch ch uh, close down a bunch of, bunch of mills. This is in the early 2000s. And they look to uh, País Vasco, to the Basque country, for help. They say, you've done this. You've re-industrialized or you, uh, they said the word. There's another word. Otro, otra palabra. Eh, re Recalculate, eh, recalibrate? No. Re but wait. Repurposing? Well, no, but there's another. But it's the whole change of your industrial base to a more modern, Industrial. So you have experience, how can you help us? So the government turned to Mondragon. The Mondragon turned to its uh, f foundation. 
And then the foundation came to Cuba and said, okay, we're gonna try to help you do this. We're gonna work in the sugar mill areas, the sugar mills that have closed down, and we're gonna try to find help in terms of restructuring the economy, the local economy, for the production of food or other resources, mostly for food, in order to help this process of shifting from an outmoded sugar mill, which we're not gonna reinvest in, to another form of, of economic uh, activity. And that's when then you find the experts and you find the people coming in and you find the training and everything else. But see how it's focused? It's difficult to just come in and just do it. Well, I, I think I have to disagree a little bit. I think Rafael is being very generous to, <laughs> to give you some hope. Forget it about doing any work in Cuba. I mean, I, I've been going to Cuba seven years and I've been involved in all kinds of educational things. I know people well. Forget it. The Cubans essentially don't want foreigners training grassroots people. You know, you might be able to go to a, a university and work there, but you know, if you're a foreigner, non-US, if you're an American, just forget it. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you stories about things that were all lined up and everything that have been disasters. And I'll also tell you from my own experience that it's gotten much worse since the normalization of relations. Okay, because I have the experience both before and after. And What's happened is, you know, you look at the ideology coming from the U.S., even from, quote, well-intentioned people, and the Cubans want nothing to do with it. They've been in war with the United States for 55 years, and they recognize the difference between a Cuban, between the government and the people. They do and they don't, you know. So I will tell you, you know, go to Cuba, enjoy Cuba, see what they're doing, but don't really even consider trying to go there to give your skill set. That's my honest opinion, so. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about, you know, everyone falling equally into the hole, but not um, being able to get out of it equally. And in the development of these cooperatives, what, do you talk a little bit about the factor of race and institutional racism um, and how that um, factors into some of the activities that Okay, so this is important because, first of all, one of the ways of getting out of the hole is through the remittances. Yeah which have changed in nature, I should say. They were, first of all, for emergency, for just getting food on the table. Then they moved to more, they became more a source of complementing your, your consumption. And now, in many cases, there are seed capital for businesses. Who emigrated from Cuba? White, urban, middle class, in its, not completely, but to a great degree through the 1980s, and then in the 1990s, a more, more you know, uh, less more representative part of the population but still the blacks are underrepresented and so are the people in the eastern provinces compared to the western provinces so you have there an inequality that comes from who you're going to get your 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 remittance from to start your little business or to do everything else. the other thing is that with 55 years of policies to try to redress uh, racial discrimination and, and do it, it's like you might say, 55 years of affirmative action, real things. You find incredible gains, but then you find things that just haven't been solved. And it, I think it, sociologists and thinkers and, and are, you know, are trying all the time to try to look at where, what has to be done. And I can give you uh, some things that show the success and some uh, data that shows the opposite. For example, you have, uh, a great deal of, of black men and women in leadership positions in local governments, in, 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 the, in the National Assembly, in, in, uh, in enterprises, and so on. But there are much many more men uh, in management positions than women. Although there are more professional women in the labor force, there's more women at the university, there's more women scientists, but in the leadership, in the management positions, there continues wow. to be more men. In terms of blacks versus white, you see just as many in the university, but there is a greater percentage of blacks in prison, in terms of the, of the total population, and a smaller percentage at the university. They have the same opportunities. They can get there, they can get a job, they can rise, but you have, a, a, you have an inequality that comes from the family situations that prevail through generations. And you have poverty that creates a, 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 a culture, let's say, of not reading when you're a child, or not having the same opportunities to be read to when you're a baby, okay? And those things, you can, you know, when you go two, three generations, those things start still weighing. 
So my children and my grandchildren have a better opportunity in Cuba than, you know, than others. That's the reality. And it has to do with the fact that we, are, we carry a social, a social inequality that you just can't eliminate with 50 years of measures and policies and things as good as they are. So that basically, this is what Europe is going to face with immigration, and this is what the US is going to face if it ever has a progressive. It's still there. There's still poverty, and the poverty sometimes is here, right? In the capacity to, to you know, move forward. Anybody else? I recently learned about the agricultural uh, history of Cuba and its transition to organic agriculture. And I was wondering if you could talk about that, the sort of pluses and minuses of it. And I'm also curious if the state appreciates the and supports the significance of the agricultural co-op. Okay, well, I'll try to measure my, <laughs> my comments. It's a very complex situation. There is no doubt that because of the, the special period in which Cuba lost access to all kinds of inputs with regard to fertilizers and pesticides, that the Cubans had to revert back to traditional forms of agriculture just to feed the population. Traditional agriculture in the countryside and also the creation of urban gardens. So there is a very large production of what we would consider to be organic food in Cuba. Now, understand it's not certified. There's no one that's going around saying this is certified. And you talk to people on the farms, and they say, is this organic? Oh, yeah. And they say, but you know, every now and then we throw a few chemicals in. It's so there is a strong organic food move, uh, farmer movement, people to people, farmer to farmer movement in Cuba. That's for real. But I think it tends to be exaggerated here in the States and in the new world of things. Right now, Cuba, we didn't mention this, Cuba imports $2 billion a year in food. It's an astronomical figure for a country that has such a slow growing economy. There's no way that Cuba can grow its economy until it learns how to be more uh, self-sufficient in food production. So I would argue there are many skeptics in the government and other places who would say, look, we can't develop, we can't get out of this hole we're in if we try to do this using organic agriculture. Uh, we've got to get the inputs in that will allow us to produce. So there is an internal battle waging within Cuba about what direction agriculture should take. And it's probably the only country in the world that I'm aware of where at least that debate can happen because there are enough people committed to the concept of organic agriculture that it becomes a real issue of discussion. Let me just make a comment to that. Um, every island in the Caribbean imports a, most of the food they eat. So this is not unique to Cuba. Everybody that in very small economies like that, tourist economies, they import a lot of what they eat. So, but Cuba could produce at least, we're exporting about 60% of the food that we consume. And we could produce 30% of that. We could reduce imports by half. So we, uh, theoretically by $1 billion. But we still have to import the other billion. The growth of tourism has outpaced the growth of the agricultural sector. And that has created pressure on prices for the consumer, which the government has shifted to the intermediary, the truckers, the markets, and all that, without really facing the fact that at the supply level, at the production level, in part because of government policies that are not conducive, but in general because there is low productivity in agriculture, we are not meeting the growth in demand. But what Eric is saying is very important. The concept of food security is defined as a national security issue in Cuba. If there is something that is as important as maintaining the armed forces ready for whatever, whatever, uh, is a, a, a growing more food. So there is, an, there is a very strong support on the part of the government to increase food production, not necessarily organic. That's the point, because they are not you know, tied to one form of, of agriculture, and the experts will tell you we need to do some things organically and some things we have to do. We have to use our chemicals or whatever. But not Monsanto. Don't worry. Monsanto is <laughs> not even knocking on the door. They know they're not even going to get a foot in the door. But the, we still, for example, when Cuba is asked, do you uh, purchase uh, GMO soy, 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 uh, soybeans, uh, whatever. Yeah, soybeans soy or feed. soy. 
Yeah, we don't know. We, we buy the cheapest one in the market because we need soy meal. And we buy the cheapest uh, whatever, a dried milk in the market. And so you're not looking for whether they, you know, it's GMO or GMO. You have to feed 11 million people who every day get a little piece of bread, a, bu a bun, which, by the way, in Cuba, we call it a bun, but we pronounce it in, we spell it in all kinds of different things. But the bun, it's 11 million little buns a year, I mean a day. And one liter of milk for every child until they're seven. And between seven and 13, one liter of soy milk, which in Cuba is considered the worst thing in the world. It's like, how can you drink that shit, you know? And soy milk, which, you know. And so, but you have that commitment to the population. How do you do it with the resources that we have available? You had a question of. Um, can you talk a little bit about gender and women, and um, who's doing? Is there daycare available, and what about the really progressive family policy they used to have, and what about government employment? Or where are women being employed versus men? So again, with with women, uh, a little bit of the of the thing I was talking about with race exists. There are. Uh, there are inequalities that are, that are historic. The, 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 the patriarch family, the patriarchal family, the paternal family, it still exists and it's a very important, you know, it still it doesn't change, except for the new generations, there's a lot more of the, like it would happen here or elsewhere, more of sharing of men and women and so on. There is a lot more space for LGBT in, in general in the society. Uh, there is a much, much more, I would say, uh, official recognition and, 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 uh, and respect for the differences, gender differences. Still, you know, moderated by the traditional Hispanic Catholic culture with which we come from. We can't, you, can't, uh, uh, you can't obviate that, right? And the other thing is that in terms of access to education, to health, like I say, right now there's more women. And here's the problem. You have, you, uh, before you could get to, you could go to college practically uh, immediately after high school. There was no selection. Now there's a selection process for, for the university. And what happens is that when you take the, 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 the test, the entrance exams and so on, the girls who studied in high school were better students because they were mature and we know that, uh, that process of, of uh, unequal growth. And so therefore they are better suited to enter the university to get better grades in the entrance exams, so you're getting more women. And, and there's actual consideration of an affirmative action plan for men, so that young men can enter. In part, this is solved some, somewhat because the men, there's still a uh, 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 military draft in Cuba for one year after you graduate from, from high school. So in that year, the boys get to be a little bit more mature. You know, when they go to college, their, their heads are more, together. But they might, have, they might have lost the opportunity to get into college the year before when you took the test, not after you have a year you know, in the boot camp, right? So the, the point is that in some cases, this policy is, has favored women a lot. And in other cases, there are lingering uh, elements of the Cuban culture that are difficult to change. And, and I think that in that sense, uh, it's a process in which um, uh, there's been a, a very conscious affirmative action on the part of the government to have a percentage of women, a greater percentage of blacks and women in, in, the, in the National Assembly, in the parliament, in the, lo in the municipal governments, in party positions. And you see that. It's clear. When you go you know, at those levels, you, you see the presence of a lot more uh, women, a lot more blacks. And, uh, and specifically, because you're asking about programs, I think, uh, they still retain the one-year maternity leave. Yeah, one-year maternity leave. Not, not paternity. Women are doing most of this. Paternity leave, leave as well. But not for you. It's available. It's, uh, it is the same. It's exactly the same, but men will not take it. And then are there... I mean, it's in there. Does the government create daycare centers? The daycare centers have also, uh, let's say, deteriorated, you might say, in the terms of, of the capacity to handle uh, children. Uh, so the numbers, uh, compared to before, when there was a, a lot more money, a lot more resources spent on daycares, they're still there. Um, my, my, my grandchildren are in, in, in daycare, in state daycare. But, for example, there's much more private daycare services available, legal, 
uh, they they have health uh, inspections, inspections by the, by the, the by the Ministry of Education, and they cost. Yeah. You got to pay. So now there is more also sort of collective, kind of cooperative without the the, the actual structure, uh, manage or, or or whatever you know child care, and care of older adults. That's where we need to move a lot more because we're getting a lot older society. So the point is that you have these resources are there. Um, I mean, these uh, programs are there, weakened by the economic situation and supplemented by a private sector that's also creating inequality. We're about running out of time, so why don't we take three questions and we'll try to deal with that as best possible. The first three hands I saw were in the back. Uh, you also, and you. You start over here. Great. Um, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about Cuba's relationship with other Caribbean nations, so okay. Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, even, even Puerto Rico, and as Cuba sort of opening up more, like what is happening there. Okay, well, let's get, yeah. you see the three questions. Yeah. You in the green so this, um, dress. Can I just ask you, in your opinion, which way do you think things are more likely to head? Do you think he was more likely to turn? In 10, 15 years, are you going to see a more democratic socialist Cuba, or are we going to see a more capitalist Cuba? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I was curious to hear more about how Cuba's choosing to relate to foreign capital. Um, like when you were talking about uh, sort of retooling the sugar mills, was that all um, internally generated capital, or was there some form of direct Okay, so uh, Cuba is a Caribbean nation, but in a, in a sense it has been uh, somewhat isolated from the Caribbean, in part by U.S. policy for many years. So now, for example, Puerto Rico is, is taking the lead in the U.S. in terms of approaching Cuba and establishing, the Puerto Rican government wants to have a, a consulate of Cuba and Puerto Rico, and they're you know they're 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 being more aggressive in terms of uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to um, to establish contact. Last year, 2015, the Latin American Studies Association annual conference was held in San Juan. It was an incredible affair. It was the first time that there were hundreds of Cubans there. Before, there's always been Cuban academics, but smaller numbers. And the uh, rapprochement, uh, the, the connection was just amazing. And I talked to a lot of Cubans who had never been to Puerto Rico. I lived in Puerto Rico for two years. Uh, and they were amazed by the connections, the human uh, similarities and connections. With the Dominican Republic, there's also a, a pretty uh, good connection. Co uh, Dominican Republic has a lot of Cubans working there, has a lot of traffic, people going back and forth. There's trade, people buying things and bringing them back. And, and, there's, uh, and political relations are OK now. You know, they're, Political relations in, in Cuba with the Caribbean are good since the 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 comic the uh, the uh, what's that? No, that's the the, the Russian one, uh, uh, Caricom, Caricom, and all all these these and actually with the English speaking Caribbean, there's also quite a bit of relations right now. One of the things that hampers is that, that there is no infrastructure for trade, or uh, or or. Uh, there's, you know, transportation, both the cargo and, and, and passengers. Everything has to go through Miami or Panama. It's incredible. So one of the things that's being discussed, and no solution has been found, because, you know, you have to pay for this, is to increase the capacity to exchange goods, services, and people using resources that don't go, or are using means that don't go through the United States. There's a question about the future. The future. God, I don't have my crystal ball today. I left it in Havana. And it's kind of a little cloudy. Uh, I don't know. I think that I can tell you my, my opinion is that the majority of the Cuban population want this uh, socialism that's sustainable, that's prosperous, and that's solidary. I think that this, is, this, would, this would be what you would expect. Everybody wants the good things. Everybody wants the, the, the health. And everybody wants the education. Everybody wants the public security that you can walk down the street at any time of day and night and nothing happens to you. you know? This type of a thing. People want this security. People want these public services. But then they want more money. They want to consume more. They want to travel. And now it's not just travel to their part of the island. Now I want to go see my family in Miami or in, 
or, you know, or get to know Europe. You know, things that were uh, uh, before not considered. I think that, that the general trend is to try to maintain this. The, the, the generation that's giving up power is making very great efforts to make sure that the legacy is, is, is maintained in a generation of, new generation of leaders that share the values. And to a certain degree, la conceptualization, this vision, is a way of putting on paper, putting on the ground, putting in people's head, what are those shared values? Now, that's the vision, that's the hope, that's what we would like. The world is changing too fast. And for example, what happens if now we, we fall into another economic crisis due to the situation in Venezuela, in Brazil, the world market collapsing or whatever, or the market for, 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 for you know, what's going to happen? Are the people, the Cuban people going to be as solidary, as, as disciplined, as, sac you know, sacrificed as they were in the 1990s with Fidel's leadership? I doubt it. I don't know. I don't think we have that resiliency anymore for the bad times, for the real collapse. You know, maybe that won't happen. Maybe the government will be able to once again steer the ship as it has done so many times before. And then we criticize the government, but we love it when they steer the ship and we're still on the ship and we're not overboard, right? So uh, to sort of follow up on that, I do think also that the future is going to depend on how the economy goes to some extent. I think, you know, I agree totally with Rafael that there is a basic DNA of support for a socialist model, but it comes at what cost if, if things get really difficult in the future. So that raises the question of foreign investment. And, you know, essentially, the Cubans recognize they need foreign investment, uh, but they're not opening themselves up like you would see other less developed countries. They're very clear that they want to control and, and really direct this process. So the way they've gone about this is put together two, over time, two distinct portfolios of investment opportunities. So they're the ones defining what they want. It's not just businesses coming in and saying, oh, we'll give you this and we'll take that. It doesn't really work that way. And so far, the Cubans have been extraordinarily rigorous in really uh, probing the foreign investors in terms of what they want. I mean, it's pretty remarkable how difficult it is for U.S. companies to try to do business in Cuba. Now, again, part of it is, as Rafael stated, because of the U.S. embargo, but it's also because the Cubans are very clear about what they see as being beneficial. So it's a different ball game. One hopes that some sort of happy medium can be found so that necessary capital can go into Cuba, but it can be directed in a way that doesn't become overwhelming or really subvert what the plans or the hopes of the Cuban government and people are. What are the two portfolios? There are yeah, two yeah, portfolios. Yeah, there are investment opportunities issued by the Ministry of, of Foreign Trade, Trade and Investment. Yeah. I mean, look up the projects that come up from the ministries. There are they, you know, hundreds of projects yeah, involved there are in the portfolio. There something projects in each one. I just want to add well, to this. Say, but one really important area there is sustainable energy. That's if you could pick any one area the Cuban government is looking for investment, it's in sustainable energy. There's two things here to add to that. One of them is that uh, investment, uh, foreign investment deals or, 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 or joint ventures today are only possible between state enterprises or public enterprises managed by the state and the foreign investor. In the law, it says that it can be done with cooperatives, but that's not, that's not the, the reality. It hasn't been uh, done with any cooperatives. It's been done only with state enterprises. And the other thing is the, is the favored, favoritism towards big projects. So there is this thing about, and in the end, the partners then become large multinational corporations because the, the, the Cuban government still favors large projects over small $1 million projects with another kind of an enterprise that then can be done at a local level with a local impact. So those are two things to overcome at some point. One other very important thing which we have not mentioned is the Mariel Special Development Zone. Yeah. So Cuba's largest investment in recent times has been in conjunction with Brazil and other actors in creating a special development zone around the port of Mariel. They're moving all the shipping activities, commercial shipping activities, from Havana to Mariel. 
because of the widening of the Panama Canal, they need a, a better deep water harbor. And in addition to that, they've created all kinds of special circumstances that encourage foreign investment in the Mariel area, okay? Now, it's not as bad as you see in other countries where they give away the store to get foreign investors. But here, it is a, a very clear strategic policy to talk about building up a, the special development zone. Okay, so we're gonna end now. Uh, I just wanted to announce that there is an international symposium uh, this November one to three by one of our partner organizations in Cuba, the Center for Sociological and Psychological Research. Uh, we have uh, groups there that are working the whole idea of participatory democracy, the concept of social, of re social responsibility for state-owned enterprises and cooperatives and so on. And so we, I'm going to leave you this. It, it's $150 uh, 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 registration fee. And, so it, and the rest of it is traveling to Cuba. It's three days in November. So if you are interested, uh, we would like to know and, you know, we would like to be of help. Um, facilitate this. And this is, by the way, one piece of advice, whether you attend this conference or not. For those of you that are interested professionally in trying to do something in Cuba, the absolute best way to even get a toehold is to go to a conference. To a conference. Because it's area of your expertise. Yeah, because you're, it's easy for foreigners to go. They encourage it, and you can have real conversations. Real, yeah, you talk with, to the people, people that you, whose office you knock on, and they won't let you in because you have a passport instead of an identity card. So, but you can see them in the conference, you can see it in the Congress, and that's the way to get in. Talk to people and open up your own individual uh, opportunities. So, okay, well, thank, thank you all thank very you so much. much. Thank you so much.